Glory to God. Okay, so we've already covered quite a bit of ground uh, when we're talk we've been talking about uh, freedom from poverty. This is actually the end of the series, although a little disclaimer, we certainly haven't covered the entire waterfront. Uh, there's a lot more to this than, and even more about this tonight than we're going to be able to uh, get into. So it's, it's uh, like a wet your appetite kind of a thing. Okay, so, but uh, this is called the cry of the poor. Uh, Proverbs 21, 13, it says, Whoso stops his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but he shall not be heard. Another way of saying that if you shut your ears to the cry of the poor, then you're going to reap what you sow. So this is a personal thing with God. You can see that he gets real strong about it. It's all the way through the book of Proverbs. Are you out there tonight? So uh, not to forget, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. So we've been delivered from poverty by Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary. Okay, where did poverty come from? We covered that early on in this, but just for the sake of repeat. Uh, poverty started, you can find the beginning of it in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Ch Genesis chapter 3 is the story of God coming and visiting uh, Adam and Eve in the garden after they sinned. And then this reality of poverty, God pronounced that uh, over Adam. He's, he spoke specifically to Adam about poverty, saying that even though he was going to really pour himself into his uh, livelihood, it was still going to produce thorns and thistles unto him. And then he made the statement, for out of dust you were taken and un unto dust you will return, talking about you know, man's physical death. Are you out there tonight? So poverty, every person in this room is familiar with poverty. You have dealt with it. You actually encounter it every day on an ongoing basis. If you watch and listen to the world, then you're certain, once you train your ear to it, then uh, you're certainly going to hear uh, what the Bible is talking about, about the cry of the poor. It's not just about asking. It's also about complaining and blaming. Amen. Yeah, man, man is bitter, in, in case you uh, haven't figured that out yet. Man is bitter. Okay, but we've been delivered from that. Isn't that good news? See, we don't have anything to be upset about. We don't have anybody to be mad at. We've been delivered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, uh, there's some twists in this that are vital for every believer. Uh, first of all, just from the outset, you should understand that giving uh, to people's needs, we'll call it giving to the poor, should be a part of your financial life. Now, we in, in this church, we kind of structure it into the things that we do. Okay, So, uh, for instance, we fulfill the Great Commission uh, by carrying the gospel uh, into the world and not just foreign lands, but also here. Okay, but then we also uh, have structured giving where we uh, give to the poor right here in our own community. You were just watching it, part of it on the uh, screens right here. Now, this has been an ongoing effort in this church right from the beginning. So I know that that's one of the reasons why God has been able to bless us. This, the church tithes, the church gives, and the church gives to the poor. Glory to God. Now, uh, without pulling up all the references, you remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, one of the, the major things that he talked about was almsgiving. So uh, as we go through this tonight, I believe you will be able to see that uh, there's, there's a kind of a, uh, a touchy thing with uh, giving to the poor. You have to watch yourself, which, which we're going to point out. And Jesus was, was uh, talking about that. He said, don't do your almsgiving to be seen of men. 
But let, let's back up a, a couple of uh, cha uh, chapters here. Uh, if you would just go back to chapter uh, 19. Here's another part of the promise. This is actually all through uh, the book of Proverbs. Praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, he says, He that has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and that which he has given he will pay him again. Now, in our culture, having pity on somebody kind of has a, a uh, condescending uh, connotation to it. That's not exactly what that means. What he's actually talking about is just giving. He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will pay him again. Amen. So uh, you can, like I said, in this church, you can actually structure your giving yourself, uh, your almsgiving through this church. And uh, we invite people to get involved in doing it with us, but we don't go blowing our own horn you know, like what Jesus said not to do with almsgiving. Okay, so uh, there, there's an element to that where uh, it becomes a uh, bad motive. Hallelujah. Okay, so if you would go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Glory to God. If there's any front row jo jokes, let me in on it. <laughs> I never gave the verse. Oh, okay. Proverbs 19, 17. I'm sorry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. No, I'm not old. <laughs> it's not a senior moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Go ahead and say amen. Okay, so every believer, this should be a part of your financial life. If you leave it out, it will be a, a snare to you. Okay, And then, of course, uh, as we'll see in going through this, that you have to uh, be careful what you do because that can be a snare as well. Okay, People, you know, the book of Proverbs is real, is, is real clear about how people try to use the needs of other people. I mean, that's just part of it. Okay, and uh, so, uh, you know, there's many high-sounding things that people talk about in the world when it comes to dealing with poverty, uh, but we're going to read it in a minute. Jesus said, you'll have the poor with you always. Uh, high-sounding ideas have been around for a long time, and they haven't worked yet, and it's because poverty is a spiritual disease. No, money won't fix it. So the idea that man can fix man's problem, see that's part of the plan of redemption, that's, that's clear, man can't fix himself, otherwise we wouldn't need a savior. Amen. See, but, but claiming that man, you know, by his own craftiness can do these things, if we just do it right, no, no, then, then what you're really saying is you don't need Jesus. And you should understand Jesus is the only one who fixes this. It's just like sickness and disease. You know, there are these, these people, these uh, billionaire philanthropists who say, well, if we just do this and this do that, we can eradicate this disease. Okay. No, you're, you're, it's the same thing. The only way to get rid of sickness and disease is to put your faith in the stripes of Jesus. He's the only answer. Amen. And that's no discredit to people in the medical field because, you know, it's just as important for them not to try to take the credit for fixing people. Because they know, all the ones that I know, know that they're not the ones that do it. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. So look at this in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 7. It says, the righteous... Consider the cause of the poor. Now, just for the sake of identifying who we are, we've been made righteous. Okay, so the verse is saying that we consider the cause of the poor, but the wicked, that would be the unsaved people, regard not to know it. Now, just on the face of it, that verse is telling you that because you have a heart of love, you're going to be concerned about 
and have an interest in the welfare of people. Okay, and just on the face of it, because the world is not born of love, no, they're not. Now, they may sound like it, but if you listen close enough, long enough, what you find out, what it really is, is they have a plan to use somebody. Amen. I hate to be so straight, but uh, God is good. Go ahead and say amen. amen. All right, so uh, if you would, uh, please go with me over to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, and uh, let's watch Jesus deal with poverty. So there's a conscience issue that believers deal with. You have a heart for people. Okay? And so uh, it, sometimes your conscience gets in the way of God uh, moving in your life. Let's talk a little bit about your conscience. Okay, your conscience is not God. And it's not God in you. If anything, it's the voice of your soul. And your conscience can be trained and changed. It's not an absolute. So, For instance, you can find people tonight who are uh, in prison who had no conscience about killing people. It still doesn't bother them in the least. If, if you inadvertently did something like that, you'd still be having nightmares. You'd have to deal with it with the blood of Jesus to get it out of your life. Are you there? Okay, so you have a conscience, and, and what, what the New Testament teaches us is that your conscience needs to be trained according to biblical principle, otherwise it's going to lead you astray. So uh, God, Jesus died at Calvary so that you could be saved. I don't, I've never seen a believer wanting to, being willing to trade their salvation because other people are not getting saved. But I hear it all the time about people feeling, you know, slightly reticent about sickness and disease getting healed and about prosperity instead of poverty. Okay, so, so it's like, okay, well then why, why would you have a problem with one and, and not the other? Okay, are, are you there? Okay. So your conscience being trained to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God is going to allow you to move forward even though not everybody's coming with you. Okay, so you, you get adjusted to that. And uh, Jesus is the one who set the example for us and showed us how to move forward in the promises of God irrespective of how... Uh, there would be people, and there were people around him all the time who did not follow. They didn't accept, they rejected. Okay? And he went on anyway. So uh, following him is the direction that we need to go. All right, so this is a uh, familiar story, John chapter 12, uh, verse 4. Uh, it says, then said one of his disciples, this was in uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. Remember, uh, this is chapter 12, and Lazarus was just raised from the dead in the 11th chapter. So we did a whole series about uh, Lazarus and how, you know, he was restored. Okay, so they're all sitting there at the table together, and Mary, Lazarus' sister, brings out a very expensive Pound of ointment of spikenard, it's called, very costly, and starts to anoint Jesus for his burying. Okay, this, uh, then uh, the, the odor filled the room. That's uh, verse 3. Are you there? Verse 4. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Sure is quiet in this Christian house tonight. I've always found it interesting that Judas was the one who was claiming to be concerned about the poor. 
And, you know, these things are not in here by accident. So it says, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. <laughs> and he had the bag. And he bare what was put therein. Now, Jesus and his 12 disciples had, uh, you know, it's like they had their own accounting system. And it, all of their money, the 12 of them, was kept in a bag. And Judas was the keeper of the bag. Now, that's an interesting thing. <laughs> you know, and Jesus knew al already that, that uh, Judas was going to betray him. So you notice that he didn't remove Judas and he didn't take the bag away from him. But they, and they all knew. I mean, this is John writing about Judas. Okay. Are you there? Okay. So this is like an inside look. Okay. So Judas speaks up about why was not this sold and given to the poor? Okay, then uh, this Jesus' answer, uh, then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying she has done this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Now, so if you look at that correctly, that gift that should have been given to the poor by Judas's mouth would have been a trip, a place to get tripped up by somebody's conscience. But Jesus just pulled out another alternative. The poor are going to be with you always. He had no problem saying that because it's true. Poverty is not man pushing man down. Poverty is a spiritual disease that man, it's a problem that man has with God. And it started in the Garden of Eden. Actually, poverty is part of the punishment for sin. That's the reason why Jesus paid for it at Calvary. Are you there? So, uh, Jesus knew why there was poverty. It's not because of a system. It's not because of people. It's not because somebody else spent all the money. So here you have an example that they could have spent the money on the poor, but Jesus said, well, you're always going to have them. You can do that anytime you want. And he didn't think it a vain thing to lavish something. This, this woman wanted to bless him. And actually in one trans, one, uh, another uh, instance of this, he called it a memorial that people would talk about from now on. Because it is written and, and people still talk about it because it's written. Amen. Are you out there? Okay, so what this is doing is this is showing you, it's awfully quiet in this Christian house, this is showing you Jesus himself stepping over the conscience problem of having nice things when everybody else is not in the same category. Woo! Glory to the king. So uh, many years ago when there was this, this lambast effort uh, against the church about money, uh, this guy, you know, uh, he said he was a Christian, but anyway, uh, he said, uh, Jesus, did Jesus have a Rolex? You know, he had a message. Did Jesus have a Rolex? And what he was trying to do was slam Preachers with nice watches. Okay, and so, well, no, they didn't have Rolexes in those days, but Jesus did have a garment that was so valuable. It was probably 30 feet long. And remember, when they were crucifying him, they didn't want to divide his garment up because it would have been less valuable. So they wanted to keep the value of the garment so they could sell it so, yes, Jesus did have a Rolex <laughs> for the day. Are you there? And the 12 disciples, you know, even though Jesus said the Son of Man has, hath not where to lay his head, he wasn't talking about not having any money. Remember, every time he needed money, they just went fishing or, or, or something of that nature. Multiply the, the loaves and fishes. 
Are you there? Glory. So Jesus did not have a money problem. And the 12 disciples actually had a, a financial system going on there with their group. They had the bag and they even had a thief in charge of the bag. And they weren't concerned about it. Why? Because God is the source. <laughs> You're not going to be able to steal them blind. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, just for, for grins, jump over to uh, the 13th chapter. Hallelujah. And uh, this is, uh, you know, Jesus actually sitting down. Now this is in the upper room in Jerusalem after they left Lazarus' house the day before. And uh, Jesus was getting his disciples ready for himself being crucified. So I'm just going to read one verse uh, to you. This is something that was going on at the table. Verse 29, it says, And some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Now, so in other words, Jesus was in such a custom of sending Judas with the bag to give to the poor that when Judas left the room that night, they thought G Jesus was just sending him on another errand to give to the poor. Point being, giving to the poor was a part of Jesus' life and example. Amen. You know, he, he preached about it in the Sermon on the Mount. He wouldn't preach about it and then not do it. Amen. So Jesus was an almsgiver. So there, there's something about almsgiving that uh, not only blesses them, it not only sets up something with you and God for God to be able to bless you, but it also does a, something else really special. Uh, one of the things that, that I've found with almsgiving is when you bless people unexpectedly, it, like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, they have a tendency to open their heart up to God. Unsaved people exult in the idea that God is good to them. So it's, it's like, it, you know, people are uh, often just kind of covered over with this callous. Their hearts are covered up. You know, they're blaming God and, you know, and all this hardship and blaming other people and so forth. And then if they get blessed, see, and they, they, they can't blame it on luck. <laughs> if, if they get blessed, then they have a tendency to break out of their callous and thank God for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And, and then they, they look, the person that did it, what they long for what is in you. So that, that's actually a major benefit, spiritual benefit of almsgiving. It, ha it, it has a tendency to crack up really hard hearts so that God is able to love on people. Amen. All right. Now, so uh, some things uh, about almsgiving. Okay. Just first of all, the, the, the message condensed is just simply give. So there's, there's actually... Uh, teaching in Romans chapter 12 that talks about people that are set in the church that are actually set to be givers. And it says, let them do it with simplicity. What does that mean? Well, the, the whole idea of, of almsgiving is that you're not going to try to get anything out of it. Amen. See, it has to be clean. So Jesus said, don't even let people know what you're doing so that it doesn't turn into a show whereby you're trying to get something out of it. See, it, it gets back to the thing of credit. 
who's going to get the credit? Okay, so when somebody gets healed of uh, an incurable disease, like the woman with the issue of blood, all of the physicians had already done everything they could do for the woman. Okay, but when she got healed, it was a uh, Thanksgiving moment. Okay, so healing does that with people too. It loosens people up. Glory to God. Now, uh, if the, the church, if the love of God was not softening the world in these ways, uh, the world, you know, that what they do is they, they get so tightened up with their retributive cycles that they can't wait to pay each other back. Are you there? And it, it's, you know, it happens all over the world. M most major wars where the real uh, bloodletting occurs is because of some sort of a economic inequity right. has built up tension. And one side is blaming the other side. And then it covetousness, jealousy, yep. propels whole groups, nations of people to try to take what other people have. Now that's been going on uh, since man walked out of the Garden of Eden. There's nothing new about it. Are you there? So when you and I as believers, see, we've been delivered from poverty. We serve a righteous and a, and a giving God. For God so loved the world that he gave. Okay. So we serve a loving God. And when we are representing him, we're actually sowing his love out to the world. We're the salt, the preserving agent. Okay. Now, a uh, little thing to look at. Nation of Israel, see that uh, Abraham accepted the covenant with God. It, one of the biggest parts of the covenant was that God would bless him financially. Amen. Okay, so uh, Abraham gets blessed financially. Eventually his seed ends up in Egypt. Okay, uh, they fall prey to the Pharaoh and to the pressures of the world and so forth. Um, nation of Israel in captivity still acted like a seasoning agent in Egypt. Because after they left, Egypt did not have benefit like they had the whole time the church was there. Excuse me, the whole time the nation of Israel was there. Now, this is one of the reasons why uh, I believe that God has raised up the United States of America as a, a place that actually, a nation, that, uh, nation of the world that actually houses the church predominantly. God is good. And so, uh, wherever the church is, we are a preserving agent for whatever house that is so what what the, of course what the enemy tries to do is freeze your heart over so that you are not able to function as a a love person and bind up uh, the apostle Paul called it bowels of mercies he talked about how he was restricted in some people and he was released in other people. So it's like a way of life for a believer to live according to what's going on in our spirits rather than according to what's going on in the culture or the society or uh, whatever. See, because what's going on in you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God is good. Okay, so giving simply 
is what Jesus, that's actually the way he framed almsgiving. Now, what happens with man, you know, man gets involved in giving, but he can't help himself. Uh, he tries to gain advantage by his giving. Okay? And um, make something out of it. One of the things that people do with churches is they, um, just like they did with the temple in Israel, they try to turn, turn what God is doing into a money maker. Okay? And so <laughs> that actually uh, is a deterrent. Praise the Lord. God is good. Okay, so uh, almsgiving is actually given to us as a way of release. It's a means of release. It's good for you to have somebody to bless. Now, almsgiving for a believer is not the same thing as tithing. See, tithing, by definition, the tithe belongs to God when it came to you. So it wasn't yours to begin with. So returning the tithe to him is actually uh, not much of a love event. Because it wasn't yours to begin with. Now, now some people really, you know, it, it, it's a big moment for them to tithe. But in reality, tithing doesn't even claim to have that benefit for you. Hallelujah. The increase that God brings to us comes from our giving. So, little definition about giving. Okay, If you're expecting to give something, get something back, you didn't actually give it. See, it, it, this is what Jesus explained about almsgiving. Your hand has to be open. You can't try to control it. You can't tell people what to do with it. You can't try to supervise it. You can't try to get something out of it. Otherwise, you're not giving. You could do all that if you want to, but you won't get a, a giver's benefit out of it. It's just manipulation. People do that all the time. You're paying people to do something for you. So giving is just exactly that. It's a clean, open heart reality. Okay? And so when believers engage in that, it's not only good for the people that you're, that you're giving to, they receive benefit, they exalt God, it, it, it blesses other people. Okay? But it also blesses you. It's a reward a spiritual reward as well as a financial reward. Okay, so he returns things back to you spiritually that you wouldn't otherwise have in your life. So people that are uh, giving in nature understand that already because you've experienced it. You're just, you're just a giver. And something happens to you when you give. Well, that's, that's called the grace of giving. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is talking about, what Jesus did. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ when he went to the cross. Remember, it was not easy. But he did it for us. Amen. So it was a free gift. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Okay, so the grace of giving is the ability to get into this spiritual flow. It's a, it's a power that changes things. So the world would be in a pickle if it wasn't for the church being integrated into everything that goes on in the world. Amen. So, you know, just like for you, uh, you know, we, we say this to people all the time. Uh, well, I'm the only Christian at my job. 
uh, would you pray for me to leave? No. No, <laughs> you need to stay there. What happens if you leave? Now, there's plenty of stories that tell the effect of what happens, you know, when, when people leave. Okay, I mean, there's secular stories that people write about that. Okay, but you are the one that it's actually written about. So you're the one that has something on the inside of you that sets you apart. So your expression of loving and giving is one of the ways that what's in you is actually transferred to others. Amen. Now, so I, I'm not trying to stretch this out, but uh, there's a walk that goes along with being a giver. Okay, because you're, you're going to be tempted to stop. Because what happens to givers is, is givers give and then people are unappreciative and the devil uses somebody to hurt you in an attempt to put a cap on your heart to stop you. Okay? And so uh, what believers have to do is say, okay, I'm going to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm not going to let this thing, this grace, be stolen from me by this horrendous act that this person has done against me. Just, just for a testimony, how many of you have ever had a Christian do something against you, hurt you? Just raise your hand. There you go. If, if, if it's true. Yeah. Glory to God. Well, you're still here. Here you are. Amen. You're still functioning. Hallelujah. Well, you, what, what that means is you passed the test. You overcame the temptation to freeze over and run. Okay, now you can hear the voice of that in believers that are not in your place. They, they've gone away from the presence of the Lord. Okay, they, uh, who knows what happened, but it is, it does happen that not everybody, not every Christian weathers these attacks as well as others. Hallelujah. So you ought to be thankful. God is good. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Okay, so uh, glory, to, glory to the King. Just a, a little bit more about this. You're not going to, there, there's not a social program that will eliminate poverty. Amen. So believing in that is a false hope. But people try to sell you that all the time. Now when they're trying to sell you that, they're actually trying to get something from you. You know, they're trying to get your support. They want you to believe in them. Okay? And th their intentions might be good, but you need to just understand, well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any difference what you want to do. It's not going to work. Because, here, here's the thing, the, the price has already been paid. See, Jesus is the answer, not the social program. There's no amount of money, there's no amount of goodwill, there's no amount of things that man can do for man that's going to equal what Jesus has already done. Now, so just quickly in closing, for when, when believers uh, buy into things like that, you're actually trading something. You're trading faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ 
And you should be honoring and glorifying Him. See, that, that's, you, in, instead of doing that, you're trading it for a false premise. Hallelujah. So the cry of the poor actually uh, draws people. Okay, because, uh, well, people want to help. Okay, and uh, giving is the love reaction, but it doesn't eliminate, the giving does not eliminate the poverty. There's no amount of money that you can give that's going to fix it. Is that too blunt? Hallelujah. God is good. Jesus is the answer. We can't take his place. We, we can't do it. We can't do what he did for other people. He's the only one. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, if you would please, to stand to your feet. Awfully quiet in this Christian house. Glory to God. The Lord is good. So uh, let's uh, have a confession. Praise the Lord. And like we said, poverty is something that every person has to deal with. Okay, and Jesus is the answer. So uh, if you would please say this with me. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. You died at Calvary so that we could be delivered. Thank you, Jesus, for delivering us from the ravages of poverty. We accept our deliverance. We receive our freedom from poverty. We also allow ourselves to be like you, to see where we fit, in the big scheme and to go along with your steps so that we're not ensnared in the cry of the poor. Thank you, Jesus, for our deliverance and for our freedom. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. God is good.